Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar. So, cats and over grooming. Bit of a long session, quite a lot to cover. I would highly recommend you get a notepad and pen handy so you can make notes as you go along and uh, we'll cover questions at the end. So, without further ado, let's get started. Okay. So what are we going to cover this evening? Quite a lot. What is grooming? What is over grooming? How to distinguish between the two? So where does it go from normal cat behavior to being a problem behavior? How to identify a cat's triggers? Allopathic, which means like traditional, you know, veterinary. Um, and alternative treatment options, and then how to support your cat to enable them to heal. So for those of you that don't know me, a little bit about myself. So my name is Julianne. I founded Naturally Cats after my dear sweet girl Pickle at the bottom there was very, very poorly. She had a raft of uh, health issues, including diabetes. She had pancreatitis, gingivitis, dandruff, arthritis. She had, she had so much wrong with her. But she was a brilliant inspiration for me to seek more support and more help for her. So my vet at the time was OK, but I wanted more, more. I wanted to be able to treat her in other ways and to give her that holistic approach. So she inspired me to train, to look into behavior, Reiki, healing, zoopharmacognosy or animal self-selection and more. And basically, I pulled it all together because... When I was looking for someone who does what I do now, I couldn't find it. So somebody that help cat, helps cats by looking at the whole picture. Pickle was sadly, uh, we put her to sleep a couple of years ago, which was one of the hardest times of my life. And there is, uh, we did a webinar on it about um, cats and bereavement. Uh, it's free. So if you head over to my YouTube channel, you can watch it. It's actually hosted um, on the uh, Naturally Cat shop under the freebie section. So you can check that out. Make sure you have a tissue handy. I do blub a little in, in the middle, um, but I try to kind of contain it. But if you are either suffering from bereavement or you're thinking that you're getting towards the end of, you know, um, it's getting towards the end of your cat's life and you need some help, I really highly suggest you check it out. So I'm a cat mum, <clears throat> excuse me, to little Leo, the little black one on the right. So he's got a tipped ear. We got him from a rescue center and he was part of a trap new term return program. So he was previously feral, although you wouldn't know it now. And he nudges my head in the morning and tries to come under the duvet. So we've done a lot of behavior work with him. And as much as he still has a very timid personality, very flighty, he's very, very cuddly and adorable. Um, so he's doing really, really well. So my mission and my purpose in life is to help to educate feline guardians so some people call them pet parents owners I call them guardians because I firmly believe that we are here to guard and be guardians of these cats that come into our lives and I'm on a personal mission to change the world's perception of cats so I don't I don't go small with my dreams you know this is a big one for me and you'll see on everything that I do whether it's social media um, emails whatever I've got the hashtag giving cats a voice. So I firmly believe that we need to speak up for them, which is why I'm doing these webinars. I do lives every Tuesday. You know, there is so much going on with Naturally Cats because I'm really passionate about speaking up for them, which is one of the things we're doing tonight. So why do cats groom? I understand there's a lot of information here and I am going to work through it. So bear with me. This isn't death by PowerPoint, but it's really helpful to be able to detail all the things that come that come into the sphere when you're dealing with a cat that's over grooming so first of all you know I wanted to start off really simple and really go back to basics so you know why do cats groom you know why why do we have these gorgeous beings this species that will spend hours upon hours cleaning themselves all day long so it comes from, you know, a very, very young age, four weeks old, you know, kittens start to groom themselves. And before that, their mother is doing it to them. And, there, and again, various reasons for it. So, yes, there is the obvious to clean them, to make sure their fur doesn't get matted, to make sure there's no, you know, grubbies on them. But actually, 
when the mother cleans around their um their anus they it helps to provoke urination and defecation so it helps them to wee and poop basically it stimulates the muscles um which they need you know when they're little to get their bodies working it also encourages suckling on the mother um and it does provide comfort so when the mum is um licking and grooming the, the kittens it's it's nice for them you know it's a i feel happy kind of hormones are released um and actually, there is an element here, which is something that will run as a theme through this presentation, which is it strengthens their bond with scent transfer. So for those of you that have done any webinars with me before, you'll know that I talk a lot about scent transfer it is the key mechanism of communication for cats in everything how they tell if their food's off, how they can tell if other cats have been around in their territory. There is so much that they use scent for. It's, it's just amazing. So when the mother is, is cleaning the kitten, you know, she's, she's making a bond with them. And, you know, when they start to then clean themselves and their mother and their litter mates, what they're doing is ingesting scent. So it's, they will build up something called a community scent, which I don't want to go too much into because that's kind of to do with territory. But every home is a community scent. So when you've got cats in a um, positive multi-cat, a positive asso association multi-cat home that groom each other, it's fab. It's great. It's a lovely thing to see them do because it make, it releases happy hormones. It's a, you know, a self-soothing mechanism. So obviously, like, you know, as they as they get older um, and to be honest, you know, um, as they develop, there are other reasons that they do that they spend so long cleaning. So it's not just to clean their fur. Yes, that is one of the reasons, but it's not the only reason. It's like scratching. They don't do it just to sharpen their claws. So it helps to regulate their body temperature. It stimulates their own circulation. And as we know, cats coats feel lush whether they're short head or long head they're great to stroke so you know they've got natural oils that come from their skin from their hair follicles etc again not going to go into the science too much there's a lot more on behavior and problems that i want to cover but part of the reason they groom is to distribute these oils throughout their coat so you know in theory you should have a cat that is grooming all over it shouldn't just be limited to the top half of their body. And if they can't get to the bottom half of their body, there's a physical issue or, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're in pain or they're struggling with arthritis. But when you've got people that come to, the, come to your home, like groomers and help support the cleaning mechanisms of your cats, it's to make sure that they're happy and they're content because if they've got mats in their coats, if, there's, if they're, um, they've got issues and they can't clean, it's gonna cause them stress. So the bit I just want to pick up from the bottom is about the scent. So as I said above, you know, cats clean each other and they take on each other's scent. But actually, as humans, we have scent. You know, when we stroke a cat, we've got sweat glands on our hand, you know, and, and that transfers our scent onto the cat. So when they lick themselves, they ingest our scent. Again, a self-soothing mechanism, something to build trust, to build the bond. So it's... There is a physical element to grooming, but there is also this emotional and behavioral um, response or, or, or reason for it as well. And that's something that I think we need to bear in mind because over grooming isn't always down to a physical problem or a physical cause. So what is over grooming? So in the cat world, you know, we use the term over grooming when you see in these pictures I've put here, a cat is basically, you know, severely licking an area. Now it's called other things, um, lick granulomas. It depends where it is as to what it's called. Aqua lick dermatitis is usually on the foot or the ankle. But basically in the wide world of cats, we use the term over grooming to signify an area where the cat will repeatedly lick and so much so that the fur tends to, to disappear. So over grooming is when it switches from being a normal, healthy cat habit, a couple of hours a day, you know, a clean all over, or if you've just stroked them, or you've had cuddles and you've done some scratches around the neck and they have a clean like that, that's all normal. That's fine. If you start to see an area where, you know, on the front of their paw or on their shoulder, on the inside of their legs, where they start to, you know, you notice the fur looks a bit thin it's cause for concern. It should be a red flag. It's something you need to be aware of. Now, 
we're going to talk about causes and uh, potential causes in a minute but I just want to mention that you know over grooming the sooner you catch it the better so if you've got any concerns get some help now there is a bit of a what's the word it's like a catch-22 with over grooming because you know if the cat does it because because they're stressed for example or they do it to self-soothe what happens when the fur starts to grow back is that they will lick again because it's itchy so you will i'm sure you've experienced a situation where you've cut yourself then you have a scab that forms and then as the skin is healing or that comes off the skin at times can be itchy it's the same with cats with their fur growing back so there is a there is an element of not only identifying is it grooming or is it over grooming? There's also an element of identifying, are they doing it because they're stuck in a habit of self-soothing or is it because they're actually starting to heal and they need additional support with that to break the behavior? And that's a really fine line and can be really hard to distinguish, but we're gonna talk about some ways that you can look for this later. So, you know, bear in mind over grooming, it is a tricky subject. And it's a tricky situation when you find that your cat is doing it. And, you know, we're going to talk through some ways that you can um, look at treatments. And I've generally found that people will work through allopathic treatments, then come to comp complementary and alternative. And that's absolutely fine. You need to do whatever it is you need to do to help your cat. Right. And there is an element as for, for us as cat guardians where we need to be aware we have a responsibility we have a responsibility to help that cat to either remove their triggers, stop their, or help break their patterned behavior or an opportunity to help them uh, heal. Okay. So first of all, we're gonna talk about physical causes. So. With over grooming, it's a bit of a minefield. And as with a lot of things with cats, it's generally a question of ruling things out to be able to find an answer. So with cats, it's usually rare that you see two or three things going on and you know what it is. It's usually a process of elimination. So it's looking at, is it this? No, okay, let's try for this. Is it this? No, let's try that. You know, it can be hard to distinguish what the cause is. Now, what I've put here is a list of various physical issues. And one of the things I want to draw your attention to, first of all, is the pictures on the right, the pictures of the ginger cat. So this came from a spot on treatment. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about my belief and my perspective on spot on treatments because that's probably going to be alive at some point. And those of you that know me know that, you know, I do struggle to share my strong views. But what happened here with the spot on treatment is it's a massive dose of chemicals and that goes onto the skin. And what happened in this instance, the cat reacted to it. So the skin was probably red as at the top, um, uh, top left of the images it's probably red and angry and itchy so the cat starts to lick it to try to soothe it to try to calm the skin to try to soothe itself from having this itch and this kind of pain or, or discomfort and then it, and then it scabbed over and then the cat picked at it because it's healing again so it's a bit of a vicious cycle so when it comes to over grooming the pictures you'll see throughout the webinar they're not they're not all of a cat over grooming on their tummy. Now, one of the the most common places for over grooming to occur is, as you can see for the picture of Wizzy here on the kind of inside the lower part of the tummy on the inside of the legs. So if you took a cat to a vet that had um, that, that showed that behavior. Sorry, I was putting the power on. Wait a minute. Sorry. If you had a cat that had um, uh, that was losing its fur in that part of its body, the vet's likely to say, yes, it's over grooming. Now, again, there can be various reasons for this. I had a cat that I've worked with a couple of years ago and she was over grooming, grooming on her tummy, which is why her guardian came to me. And actually, we tried different remedies, of which I'll come on to later. But what happened, what transpired was that she actually had cancer of her nipple. So you know, the cat was licking that area 
I believe, because it could sense there was something untoward going on in, in, in its body. But you don't always know that, right? And I'm not saying that every cat that's got an over-grooming tummy has got cancer of the nipples. What I'm saying is you don't know what's going to cause it. And there are, I, I would always advocate trying to rule out these physical physical causes. So when anybody comes to work with me from a behavior perspective or a problem behavior um, perspective, I always ask them to get checked by a vet and that's really important. So when we're working with our cats and we're being their guardians, we have a duty, a duty of care to them. And part of that is seeing the vet, it is using where needed allopathic treatment it's making sure that there are no um, parasites, that there are no, you know, ringworm and there are no allergies. There's no mites on the skin that are causing the cat to itch and to constantly need to groom to get rid of the, the bugs and on its skin. It's making sure that, you know, there are no internal pain issues. Um, you know, I've worked with a cat that was shot with an air rifle and thankfully she didn't over groom, but she could have because she had constant pain in a particular area of her body. You know, these things can happen. Also, it could be, you know, neurological, it could be allergies. So you really need to rule out some of these things. And we'll come on to that in just a minute about how you can do that when you approach a vet. So, you know, have a think about, you know, have you been in a situation where your cat has um, had a, a spot on treatment? Have you been in a situation where they've had uh, an accident and then since that accident, they've started over grooming? Are you aware of anything physical that has happened to the cat and then they started to overgroom. you know have they had a matted coat have they had issues where you know they've been outside and you know they had a, a traumatic experience you're not quite sure what it is but you know they've come in they've been a bit scared and then then they start to overgroom. you know have a think about what it could be and always make sure that you speak to your vet which again like I said we'll come on to so the second part I wanted to talk about is that there could be a behavioral cause. Now, this is this in my experience as a um, holistic cat practitioner, when I've dealt with overgrooming, it's usually a behavioral trigger, behavioral issue. Now, again, not always the case. So it is really important you get the cat checked, really important. Rule out those other issues that could that it could be, check for other potential physical problems physical illnesses so sadly you know this dear cat here ob and who was the previous one yeah was he agro luna you know all of these images are cats where they're over grooming and you know i haven't worked with these cats specifically but if you look at the extent of their over grooming in my opinion that's chronic that is that's long term that's been going on a while so you may find a situation where you see, if you look at the picture here of Luna, I don't know, you can only just see it on her heel. She started to have a bare patch. Now, we had a cat that had a bare patch on her foot and actually turned out that she had a sore that was inside underneath the skin, like kind of like an abscess. Um, and, you know, we needed to get it, to get it seen to. It was treated by the vet and the kind of licking, the constant licking from her stopped. But just be aware where your cat is grooming, you know, don't you don't need to sit and watch them. But when they're having a clean, just have a look and see. Are they doing it, you know, for hour upon hour upon hour? Are they doing it in a certain area all the time or are they giving their whole body a clean? So sadly, behavioral responses or behavioral reasons, uh, behavioral causes for over grooming are really quite popular. And I have to say in this kind of day and age, it's more frequent than, than I've ever experienced. So the first few um, points that I've put here are about emotions. So again, if you know naturally cats, you know that I am about giving cats a voice and I firmly believe that every problem behavior comes from an emotional cause, over grooming, inappropriate toileting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, like I said, there are situations where it's, it can be caused by a physical issue, which is why they should be checked by a vet. But in my experience, a lot of these emotional reasons can cause this behavior in cats. So stress, anxiety and fear, you know, they are emotions that are only just in the last probably, I don't know, five to 10 years. 
being linked to cats. People never really thought that they experienced that before. You, you know, you could find articles and information online that showed that cats dealt with pain and maybe a bit about anxiety and maybe a bit about um, stress. But anxiety, you know, that's usually a word that people associate with humans. But cats do suffer with anxiety. We've, I did a webinar on anxiety again. I think it's a free one. So check out the freebies on the shop page. You can watch the replay. Um, because it's a self-soothing mechanism, cats will go to this behavior to basically cope. So if a cat's stressed, if they're fearful, if they're anxious, they need to do something to make themselves feel better. So as humans, what would we do? I don't know, have a glass of wine, meditate, um, shut ourselves away from people for a couple of days, turn off our phones, not look at social media, put on a film, I don't know, whatever it may be. We, we have the capacity to pick and choose how we feel and what we think will help to soothe that emotion. Cats don't have that capacity. We have domesticated them so much that they have whatever resources we provide for them and that's it. So I saw a post a couple of days ago that said you can never have too many resources for your cat. And I thought it was brilliant because it's so true. When I see, I've got a client who has so much, she's catified her, her home so much and her partner just makes me laugh because she rolls her eyes whenever they tell me they've got a new something. But it's, it's really important that we provide for our cats. So stress and anxiety and fear and worry, a cat needs an outlet for that. It needs to be able to process that emotion. And one of the most natural behaviors for them to do that is to overgroom. It is to lick, to lick, to lick, to lick, to lick. It's, the, it's almost in a way the mechanics of the behavior, which is like ritual and calming. And that is like, you know, a bit OCD type. But it's also the, like I said at the beginning, it's the um, hormones that are released from this behavior that help to calm them down. So for those of you, we're going to carry about, uh, talk about how to um, address them. I think we talk about, okay, just checking what we've got here, what time we're on. Um, worry and boredom. In fact, worry kind of comes with fear and anxiety, really boredom and lack of stimulation so I think that's one that a lot of us can be guilty of and cats take can take time and effort from us which we don't always have the capacity to give so people say that cats are really aloof and you know you just like let them get on with it and I have to say as one of the myths I'm trying to bust because that is not the case at all at all now you know Yes, older cats maybe don't play as much, but they still need mental stimulation. You know, younger cats need interaction. Cats are social beings. They, they, they like interaction. They like connection. They thrive on it. So if you've got a cat that's coming up to you and booping you on the arm or, you know, trying to give you a signal that says, play with me, we're doing them a disservice if we don't. Now, look, I know it's not always possible to do it. I'm fully aware of that. And I'm very cognizant of the fact that I don't always do it when Leo needs it. But maybe if we can just try to be aware a little bit more. So with a cat that's over grooming, if they're doing it because of boredom or lack of stimulation, that's that's an easy kind of fix, really. You know, think about the resources that they have. And I'm not just talking about food station, litter trays, scratching posts, cat trees. I'm talking about levels, you know, height, expand their territory. Look at toys. I'm talking about toys that need inter that need human interaction, you know, rods and poles and fishing, uh, fishing ones to those that you can leave down for your cat, you know, um, uh, puzzle feeders or, um, you know, mechanical toys. And also, you know, have a box of, of cat toys, rotate them. They're just like young children. Pick them up if they've been down for a week, you know, maybe make it one of your weekend routines that every Sunday when you're doing the hoovering or whatever, you know, you pick up all the cat toys and you put, bring out box two and you put different ones down. It will help to give them mental stimulation. But also it's quite important that we spend time to actively engage with them and play with them. And again, there are different types of play. So there's one where you could be watching your favorite box set or playing on your phone and you just got a wand and, you, and you're just throwing it from side to side. That's not gonna you know, enthuse anyone. 
and cats they're they're carnivores that you know they they have this predator um behavior response in them and they need to hunt and and you know mimic prey so waving a one from left to right is not going to bring out that instinct in them that's not going to bring that hunting mechanism to the forefront so you know we need to be thinking about if you've got a wand toy for example you know you flick it a little and you pause and you quickly scurry it again and then you pause and then you maybe do a quick jump you know you, you need to vary what you're doing with them with the toys and what i would say is you know and every time i do a webinar or a live I tell you, Leah must love it because I always think I'm going to be a better cat mum and I make more time for him. So, you know, have a think. Can you set like a 10 minute timer on your phone every day or like three days a week or something to just give them a little bit more in, uh, interaction, give them a little bit more stimulation? Have a think about what stimulation you're giving them. What have you got down? What toys do you have? Not every, not everybody, not every cat likes the same sort of toy. So we've got a kickaroo for Leo, which is like a long rectangle, like um, full of um, stuffing with like a feather thing on the end. Um, and he's not really that keen on it, actually. Whereas I've got a client of mine who gave it to her cat and she's on a second one within a couple of weeks because the cat has used it so much. It's got holes in it, you know, so have a look online. I mean, one of the things that's great about this sort of, you know, the 21st century is that we are in a, an age where our animals are becoming more and more kind of, um, what's the word, anthropomorphized. So there is just more and more and more stuff out there for them. The different types of cat toys you can get online is just phenomenal. Make sure they're safe, make sure they're good quality, but have a think about stimulation for your cat. So if they come over to you and they try to engage with you, put down the device, turn off the TV and give them attention because it will stop them going over, you know, huffing, which is what Leo does. Maybe yours don't huff, but it will stop them looking at you, feeling dejected, rejected, sad, frustrated, and going and sitting on the sofa or behind the sofa or on the bed or wherever that their safe spot is, and then just licking and cleaning and licking and cleaning. So, you know, have a think about what it is that you can do to kind of up your game to support your cat a bit more. So separation anxiety, that's a hard one. It is a hard one. I would definitely advocate remedies. So for those of you that know me, I use botanical remedies to support behavior modification. And I would definitely recommend remedies. Again, if you go and look at the anxiety webinar, we talk a bit about that. There's also a self-selection one. So, you know, I would be advocating using a herb garden, which we'll come on to, to help them. And you'll also need to think about doing behavior modifications. So your, your pajamas that you wore to bed last night, you want to be leaving them around the house, you know, grubby as it may sound, you've got permission to leave your dressing gown on the sofa for the day, you know, leave things around the home of you, of the, of, leave things around the home that smell of you. It will help them with this whole scent world that they've got going on. Other changes are quite uh, other causes are quite possibly changes in the home. Now, this is one of the biggest, biggest causes that I see that people just don't kind of twig, don't don't kind of realise. But I've put here changes as in like, you know, a new animal, baby, partner. Those are like quite significant changes, right? You know, bringing a baby home, bringing a puppy home, a new cat, husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, roommate even. They're actually quite significant, but actually some cats are so sensitive to change that the smallest change can affect them. Now, look, I get that that's going to be really hard. You're like, Julianne, how on earth can I figure out then what's been the cause of this? And that's the biggest issue that we have with overgrooming is figuring out what the cause is, which is why, in a way, the vet side of things, the, the physical um causes are actually easier to deal with because you you can get a test and you know what it is or you put it down to something you know they had a spot on and then they've got a bowl patch you know what it is the behavior side is harder i understand that so with cats you know moving their food bowl changing their food changing your routine all of these things can affect them and it can be hard to figure out what the cause is so there are times when times when you can spend a lot of effort trying to identify the cause and it and, and you don't get to it you don't get to the bottom line you don't get to that answer and what I would say is you have to make peace with that and as much as I am somebody that advocates never treating a symptom and always getting to the cause and the root cause of the problem and dealing with that with over grooming 
as a human, we have to admit that sometimes we, are, we don't have control. We don't know. We don't know what caused it. We, we don't know what their trigger was. And you have to kind of put it to bed because as I've put the last point here, our energy, our emotions and our vibration can hugely impact our cats. So if you check me out on social media, you'll find um, uh, Facebook lives and IG t- and Instagram lives. Where we've talked about how cats pick up on our energy, our emotion and our vibrations. And oh my goodness, it is it's kind of alarming in a way, but actually it's it's also quite profound how much our energy can affect a cat. So, you know, you come home from work. OK, bad example, because we're all working from home at the moment, but you turn off your computer or you've had, you know, a difficult email that you've been dealing with and you come into the rest of the house or you come into the, the front room or whatever. And you're like, you know, you're really angry and, and you know, a bit bit miffed, let's put it politely your cat's going to pick up on that energy. It's going to sense that vibration from you. And actually some cats that are particularly very sensitive may struggle to deal with that. So have a think about how you show up for your cat. What do you bring to the, to the table? And again, I'm not saying that we cause a cat to be over grooming. What I'm saying is there are times that we can look at what we're doing to help support them and our energy and our emotional state can make a difference to this. One last thing before we move on from causes is the picture on the right at the bottom is actually Pickle. And oh, I miss her fluffy belly so much. Um, we found uh, that bold spot one day. I think my husband, you know, I picked her up and he said to me, oh, what's that on her tummy? And we realised she, she had this bold spot. And I was, I freaked out because I'm like, oh my God, she's over grooming. What are we going to do? And I'm like, hang on a second. She's like 16 years old. She can't get to that part of her tummy. I know she couldn't because we had to not brush it. In fact, I won't go into it, but I knew she couldn't get to that part of her tummy. I knew she couldn't physically bend that way. So I didn't know what earth is going on. Took it to the vets, tests, et cetera. You know, I was watching her like a hawk and she never went near it. Not once in probably about three to six months did I see her lick it, go near it. And basically the vet concluded that it was um, almost like a friction burn. You know, it's on her tummy. That's where she slept a lot of the time. She was frequent on a heated blanket because she was old. She had arthritis. So the vet was like, you know, she's just rubbed away her fur. And that part of her skin was so soft. It was like, it's like a cloud. I can't even explain it. But you can see she had a little bit of dandruff because she had dry skin for the meds that she was on. But it wasn't inflamed. It didn't look irritated. I offered a remedy. She wasn't interested. So, you know, she just had a bowl patch. And, and sometimes that's what happens. So if you if you see a bold patch, don't don't stress out and don't freak out. They're over grooming. You know, just be mindful and have a look at if they're going near it and what they're doing with it. So this is what I want to talk about, how to identify their triggers, what to look for. So if you join the anxiety webinar, and I think potentially the aggression webinar, you'll know that I'm a great big fan of saying get a notebook. And those of you that have watched me on these before will just, you know, will smile because that is generally my go to answer. Now, we have books downstairs. We write in a book when we give Leo his asthma inhaler and we write down how many puffs we give him. We've got a book where we write down um, what food he has. So we write the date, the time, the amount he has and if he has water with it or any medication with it. Um, And was there a third one? No, because we started to write when he was coughing in the food book. Now, this may sound overkill. You may think, oh, my God, Julianne, you got like proper OCD with your cat there. And then that may be true. I may have a little I am highly organized, but we did it with Pickle. And actually, it was one of the best things we've ever done. So when we were trying to get her diagnosed and found out she had diabetes, we were able to go to that with all this information. This is when she's eaten. This is when she threw up. She threw up four times in two days. You know, she um, she wouldn't eat on this day. And then when we were doing our blood glucose, we were writing it down every time we blood checked her. So we were able to, to be able to plot what her glucose level was to accurately dose her with insulin. Same with Leo and his asthma inhaler. And look, I'm giving you examples of how to do it if you've got a cat on medication. But I tell you, it's one of the best things you can do is to start to make notes because... We have so much going on in our lives day to day. We are so busy trying to manage everything, everything we deal with, everything that's an individual we have to cope with. And when we've got a cat with a problem behavior, 
is extra stress and things can get cloudy things can get kind of foggy in your mind so you know get a new book get a notebook you know put a note on your phone I don't care but start to write down you know 7 p.m Tuesday the 23rd you know groomed for 10 minutes even if that is like a normal behavior right great but if you've got an inkling that the cat is over grooming start to write stuff down as soon as you can what you see when you see it and how long for those are going to be the key bits of information so you can so you will also what will happen with that is you'll get a pattern you'll be able to see okay so over a four day period you know um moggy spends um i don't know eight hours a day cleaning uh, eight, eight hours in those four days cleaning but actually 20 minutes of that hour she was like in the zone you couldn't distract her you couldn't give her a treat you couldn't get her out of, off the bed she was completely um devoid of interaction make some notes about how they're reacting what they're doing how intense they are in their grooming how long they're doing it for because when you go to the vet the first thing they'll say to you is how often does it happen and if you turn around and say to them oh well she's been doing it for a while that's actually really unhelpful and if you want to be able to work with your vet which I absolutely advocate you do because they're amazing and there is a need for vets in, in many situations if you go to them and say my cat has you know she's got this bold patch which again take photos um it, it was this big a, a week ago and now we're or you know two weeks ago and now I've measured it on my phone and it's two inches bigger so the the, the, the surface area is increasing right the sooner you get help the sooner you can nip this behavior in the butt the longer things are left especially over grooming the longer the behavior is left the harder it is to stop it and fix it because what happens is the cat gets into a pattern the cat has only grew over grooming as its coping mechanism there are no other kind of like healthy cat ways of dealing with its emotions its go-to reaction its go-to behavior its go-to coping mechanism is to lick 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 so start making notes look at what they're doing when they're doing it take some photos you know if it starts to be a little bit on the leg um okay let's use this example it's a little bit on the leg you've noticed it twice and you know you're just kind of like a bit aware of it you know make a note of it just just jot it down somewhere that you won't lose the bit of paper or the information because then it may not happen for like four months which is great but it may come up again or it may happen in two weeks time and you could be like oh, okay so what what's the what's the trigger here what's the pattern what's happened when they've started licking so again if you've got your notebook handy you're doing it on your phone and you've written down that your cat's been grooming for 25 minutes and they've done like all over great and now they've gone to their tummy and you know the time is like 10 minutes later and they spend you know 40 minutes there have a think about you know is that always the way it happens do they always have a groom like all over and then go to the tummy or is it a question of the children come home and then you look over and the cat's cleaning its tummy does the doorbell ring and you look over and the cat's looking and cleaning at its tummy so i've said before we have the need to be a detective and it's absolutely true and yes, it is hard when there is a lot going on, which is why I'm advocating the notebook to make notes as much as you can. So as I said at the beginning, with the vet treatments and the, you know, the physical issues, it's a process of elimination. So if you're able to say, okay, it's not when the doorbell rings or it's not when, you know, the other, the, the neighbor's cat comes past the patio door, she's actually fine when that happens. Okay, so what is it? When do you see the cat go and do this over grooming behavior? And again, if you start to make notes, things may not make sense straight away and you may feel a bit of a muppet for doing it. But I guarantee you in a couple of weeks, you'll start to see a pattern. You'll start to see what's in the data, what's in that behavior. So rather than thinking, oh, I'm sure she did it a couple of weeks ago, you don't need to, to have that doubt. You've got the factual information there. So I've put at the bottom here, you know, have a think about, is it any of these things? You know, is it when they're on a certain cat bed? Do they go, you know, are they on a cat bed for a while, particular fabric, and then you see them go and sit on the sofa and do it? You know, where were they before they started to overgroom? You know, have you changed your washing powder? Because actually cats can't, some cats can be quite sensitive to that. 
think about your people and think about the dynamics in the home. So have the group dynamics changed? You know, has a partner left or has someone come home? Um, like I said, have you brought a baby home? Have you got someone living with you now? Are you, you know, and again, I appreciate COVID is potentially having, you know, uh, causing issues with these things. But again, with the unknown, this is what can happen if we've got people either in the home that aren't usually there or people that aren't in the home that are usually there. I think I said that the right way around. Um, how does that, <laughs> how does that affect the cat? You know, it will have an impact on them. So again, visitors. So I tell you, one of the things that we have, my sister lives just down the road with my niece who's six and they come up and we've got a porch. So they stand basically on our driveway. I'm on our porch steps. So we're, you know, socially distanced, very safe. And Leo does not like Annabelle because she's six and she wants to basically face plant and squish Leo until he's just fluff in her arms and he won't go anywhere near her. So as soon as he hears her voice, he basically hides so we'll either hide behind the sofa or recently we've got a cat flap installed he will bolt out of the cat flap so they're just visiting the house they're visiting outside and I came in I think it was Sunday and my husband said to me oh my god you know he looked my husband looked really stressed and he had his phone and he was like I'm just about to phone you Leo's freaking out I'm like what do you mean he's freaking out and he said to me he's just running around the house he's pacing he's really stressed and I was like okay What's, what's happened? He's like, well, as soon as you started talking outside to your sister, he went all funny. So things may happen that we're not even aware of. But again, it's an opportunity to write down, make notes, see if you can identify their triggers. And like I've said, take photos so you can manage changes. They say you should do that with moles, you know, on humans. It's exactly the same premise with cats. So you can see if the surface area is getting bigger. You can see if they've changed size. You can see if it's always around the, you know, a certain nipple or a certain foot. Um, and if they let you, you know, have a feel around the area. Can you feel a lump? If you feel a lump, straight to the vets. You know, like I said, let, let's get them checked out physically before we start looking at the behavior work. Okay, so allopathic treatment. Now, again, this will heavily depend on what the results are of the tests. So, as I said, get help as soon as you can. It is so important. Even if your cat's got like a little fuzzy bit, right? Just get them checked. The vet may say to you, make notes, take photos, come back in a month which is fine if they do, you've put it on their records, you've put it on their radar, okay? You've got almost got like a marker. You've got a point in time where you know this is where you start to get it investigated. If it becomes chronic and you've got a picture like with OB here, it's bigger, it's wider, you know, it, it, it's not stopping. You can push your vet and ask for further help. So this is where you need to be brave. Not all vets are the same, just like with people. And it's really important that you trust your vet. And it's really important you've got a good relationship with your vet and you can be honest with your vet. So we are allowed to ask questions of our vet. We are allowed to question what they say, to ask about certain tests, to even ask for a second opinion. Now, years ago, I was very much like, my vet is, you know, a vet, he is the font of knowledge with my cat and whatever he said was like that was it right believed it did it end of no questions no doubt no nothing I learned the hard way with pickle um that actually and I'm not gonna go into that but you can ask questions you know and, and a good vet will answer your questions and a good vet will have a good conversation with you when we see our, our current vet Katie our appointments always overrun because we talk so much I'll ask a question and she knows my background and we're, we're, we're there talking for like 20 minutes about one question that's actually like off at a tangent and not really Leo related, you know, but your, your vet should be able to engage in a conversation with you and help educate you. Because at the end of the day, the more educated you are, the more you can look after your cat, the less you're going to see the vet, right? Now, I'm not saying that we can do tests at home, you know, that, that let's be sensible people. So just be aware that you can ask questions and you can push and you can ask your vet to investigate things further and never be afraid to ask for either extra help or a second opinion or for a referral for complementary treatments, which is next. How are we doing for time? Oh, God. So um, I put a list here of different allopathic treatments. 
so we've got everything from you know blood tests and allergy testing skin scraping to medications so like i said the first test really would you would want you would hope a vet would do would be a skin scrape to make sure there are no mites there are no basically parasites there's nothing topical there's nothing wrong with the skin there's no fungal infections there's no yeast infections because all of these things can aggravate the skin and yes they probably would look red and, and irritated and angry but not always so you you know you want to be asking you know is your vet going to investigate the skin first because you kind of look at what's topical what can you see what's going on there so you might need to have a topical skin cream you might need to give the cat antibiotics depends what it is Alternatively, it could be that you need to have, you know, slightly stronger medication. So it could be like, you know, if the cat's got allergies, which is bizarre, but cats are coming up, up with this more and more. And again, the last few years, like I don't know if it's because we're more aware of our cats and, and, and caring for them better than we have ever done before or, or, or what it is. But a lot more cats have got allergies now. So it could be that they've got to have antihistamine tablets or steroid injections. Again, sometimes these reg these treatments are regular and you've got to go back like once every six weeks to get a shot. Depends what the problem is. But again, your vet should be treating something when they've got the, the, the test results and the information to prove it. So if your vet says to you, let's give them a steroid injection and see what happens. If I was you, I would question why they're doing that. What, what has led them to that route? what is given them that cause to use that treatment? Because steroid injections for cats are very much like antibiotics for humans. They can be overused and there's, never, there's not always the information that leads to that as being the most appropriate form of treatment. Again, steroids do have their place, but if your vet goes straight to steroid injection, I would just question why. And then the last, so uh, hormone treatments, um, one of the last two points I wanna bring up is food. So food has a huge impact on our cat's digestion, our cat's skin. So our skin is like the biggest organ, isn't it, of our body. And as you know, as humans, you know, if you eat McDonald's and pizza and, you know, junk food for four weeks, you start to get spots and, you know, greasy hair and your body is like, oh, come on, what are you doing to me? Same with cats. If they're, nutrition is poor it's going to react in their body so have a look and see what you're feeding them see if you're giving them in a species appropriate diet funnily enough we had a another free webinar i didn't realize i managed to put so many plugs in this webinar we have uh, there was a free webinar that we did on cats and cat food again head to the freebies on the shop page and you'll be able to see it a word of caution if your vet says to you let's put them on a hypoallergenic food to see if it will stop them over grooming make sure it's not a cereal or grain-based diet. That's all I'm going to say on that, because otherwise I'm going to go down a food rant. I would really advocate you watch the food webinar. We talked about cereals, grains, popular brands of food. You really need to know what's in your cat food and what you're feeding them, because it will have a huge impact on their digestion and their body and their skin. And the last bit really here is... Um, antidepressants so anti-anxiety medication Prozac gabapentin and gabapentin is so popular these days I've seen in so many forums on Facebook people putting their cats and gabapentin for anxiety and again it has its place for sure I know another a, a lady a friend of mine who's got a cat on um, anti-anxiety medication and it's really really helping so there is there is a place for it but I would advocate like with humans, you try a few other things first and see if they work. Maybe you need to use, you know, a couple of different treatment options. At the end of the day, what I would say when it comes to medication and obviously Leo's on steroids because he's asthmatic, so I'm not against it, but the medication can help with like a chemical imbalance in the body. But if it's a behavior, behavioral response, or behavioral trigger that's that started their over grooming dulling their kind of you know the, uh, altering their chemical makeup isn't necessarily going to stop the behavioral response that they have so unless you figure out what the trigger is and remove that behaviorally speaking the medication is almost like a plaster you know if you think about humans it's all very well if i was an anti-anxiety medication because i like being in crowds 
But, you know, if, if I've got to go to, a, if I've got to be in a crowded situation, I can take medication and yeah, I might feel a bit better, but I'm still going to be like super duper stressed. So why don't we look at why I don't like being in crowds and try and do some behavior work with that, you know, go to a meeting with one person, then two people, et cetera, et cetera. Same with cats. What can you do to support the behavior alongside the allopathic treatment? Okay, complementary and alternative. So many here. So first thing I'm going to bring up is the god awful um, trend that I've seen about these claw covers. So I'm going to speak up on this webinar um, because they're horrific and I really, really advocate against them. They're not safe because the cat can ingest them and they're absolutely not good for the cat emotionally. And to be quite frank, I don't even think they look pretty. I think they look, you know, disgusting in my opinion. And that is heavy coming from me to use those words, but they're terrible. And I can't believe someone's invented them. So they stop the cat being able to shed the, the sheaths of their, of their nails. You know, they stop the cat being able to exhibit normal behaviors, which is scratching. Um, please don't use them. If you've got issues with your cat scratching furniture, come and contact me or, or another behaviorist or post in a forum or get help. Do not use them. They can actually be quite distressing for the cat when you put them on and when they're on. So please, so, you know, if you find that you've got a cat that's over grooming and it's also scratching, it's probably like, oh, it's itchy, you know? So if it's using its claws against its skin, don't, can don't, don't stop the, um, the mechanism of them doing it, we figure out why they're doing it. You know, look at the the, the problem, not just the, the symptom. So I've worked with a cat and uh, years ago now, and he had a terrible, like, we thought it was a yeast infection all along his back and it was sore. And oh, she, he, his amazing guardian was making him body suits. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I really struggled because I was like, well, the cat can't get to himself to clean. And there is a real fine line between, you know, keeping their, them safe, because basically he he had uh, an issue where the, the, the skin was bleeding. There was a lot of pus and infection and stuff. So he was quite heavily poorly. Um, but I've seen people where their cat is over grooming like we had in the previous picture. I see on the tummy area. I've seen people that have put those cats that have that kind of um, situation in a bodysuit. And again, it's likely to stress the cat. If they can't get to themselves to clean, to do this behavior, to release those happy hormones, they're gonna get even more stressed. And then you might find that they start scratching furniture or urinating around the house or howling or, or you know, not eating. It can lead to a whole host of other problems. So with body suits, I would say again, you need to try and identify the triggers and try to calm the emotional reason behind the over grooming. So Feliway and Calming Collars, we talked about those in the anxiety webinar. Um, Feliway, it only affects 60 to 70% of cats because it's a synthetic pheromone, but again, it can help some. So definitely worth a go. There are different types of Feliway as well. Um, so I can't recommend a specific one. It really depends on your cat. You've got to try one. If it doesn't work, try another one. I think there's like three, maybe four. Um, calming collars I would highly advise against again it's, you've got something that you're putting on to your cat that they don't have a choice they don't have a choice to get away from the chemicals they don't get it they don't have a choice to get away from the synthetic you know scent that, that's on them which is, again potentially could be quite stressful so I've put in here a raw diet as I mentioned before you know if you can, if you don't like the idea of a raw diet, then feed wet food, never feed dry food ever. Um, devil's food, check out the food webinar. Um, so have a look at a raw diet, simple proteins, remove chicken, remove beef, remove pork. We had pickle allergy tested a couple of years ago and we found out that she was intolerant to like, I think it was seven different proteins, ridiculous. So we ended up having to put her on the most expensive raw food I could find, which was duck at the time my life she was such a little madam I love her so much um but now with Leo we've got him on raw and he has a mix of rabbit uh, rabbit game and they just put a new one out which is goat 
I don't know if he's going to be keen on that. And to be honest, I'm a vegan. So, you know, I do struggle with giving him a raw diet. So don't think that I'm just saying this, you know, as a flyby comment. It is what's best for him. I'm not going to talk more about food. Not every cat will be suitable on a raw diet, but just consider it. Have a think about it. Watch the food webinar. I'm going to put a pin in that. OK, so calming powders. <clears throat> um, you can get different things online. Um, if you look at, you know, Google over grooming or, or, or look on Amazon. Um, so I would always say, look at your ingredients. <clears throat> For those of you that know naturally cats, um, I use complementary and alternative methods. I use botanical remedies with my clients, with Leo on myself. I've had so much green clay on my hands recently since I've been burning myself in the kitchen. Um, so there are powders you can get, there are, you know, drops for the water you can get to like deal with anxiety. Um, if you're going to try any of this stuff, think about giving the cat a choice. And that mice may sound bonkers, but have a think about giving the cat a choice. If you're going to put drops in their water, make sure you put another water bowl down, you know, so that they can choose the one with the drops and the one without. Because if you couldn't get, get to fresh water, I'm sure you'd be quite stressed. You know, if you were having stuff added to your food that you didn't want or you didn't need, you'd be quite stressed. Same with our fairies. So have a think about how you're, you're medicating them or how you're offering remedies and support to them. So I always use self-selection. Call it zoopharmacognosy, self-selection, whatever you like. You know, I have stuff down for Leo that he can choose as and when he needs to. Um, so green clay powder is really, really helpful. It's anti-inflammatory, it's antibiotic, antifungal, not antibiotic, no, antifungal, antibiotic, anyway. Um, and it can reduce inflammation and um, infection and itching on the skin. So I use green clay, it's a loose powder. I mix it with a little bit of water and put it on my several brands on my hands. Uh, it dries and then I leave it on for a couple of hours, wash it off and then reapply. So it's great for healing the skin. Um, if you if you use it as like a dusting powder, it can help to reduce any inflammation and itching. But again, offer it. So have some green clay powder on a little saucer, offer it to your cat. See if they slowly blink their eyes. See if they lick their lips. See if they put, present their body to you, if they, if they come and bring a part of their body to you take that as a sign that they are saying yeah I'm up for a bit mum you know get a little makeup brush a little blusher brush or eyebrow brush and just just gently dust it onto the um uh the kind of bold bits or the itchy bits um chickweed macerated oil oh, fabulous macerated oil the picture on the right here is of one of my gorgeous clients Sammy who was having issues with, um, he was being sick actually. Um, and chickweed is great because it, it soothes the digestive tract. And as a result of that, it helps to calm the skin almost from like the inside out. So I'm not gonna go into the science, but in all my experience with, with the over grooming cats I've dealt with chickweed in either the dried herb, as you see Sammy with there, who's got his throat chakra positioned beautifully over it. Um, or as a macerated oil is fabulous. So again, using self-selection, get some chickweed macerated oil, put a little bit on a saucer or a, or a teaspoon, whatever you like, put a bit on the end of your finger. In fact, try both. Offer it to the cat, see if they'll lick it, see if they sniff it, see if they want to ingest it, see what they want to do with it. Again, if they present their tummy to you, gently rub a very thin layer over the skin. So we talk about cats and ingesting. And when it comes, if you use self-selection principles, there's no danger. If they're saying, yes, I want it on me. If they decide to lick it off later, it will be okay. Trust that your cat knows what it needs. So essential oils, I'm not gonna list essential oils here to try with over grooming. To be quite honest with you, when I use essential oils with an over grooming cat, I, I have to be in tune with the cat and I have to know what Chinese five element they are. I need to know what the potential triggers are because it's a question of looking at whether you're, you're dealing with, you know, anxiety, sadness, um, stress, frustration, and different oils will support in different ways. Um, and I, as those of you that know Naturally Cat, I will only advise about essential oils with either clients or people that I'm working with or those that have been trained with Zoopharmacognosy because 
essential oils can be misused with cats and this is where the, the fear of using essential oils comes from now you can really really safely use essential oils with cats and actually Nyana and I wrote this book which might be back to front actually I don't know if that's the right way around the aromatic cat and we talk in here we've got 40 botanical profiles and we talk in here about how to use essential oils with cats safely um and we've got a bit in there about over grooming in fact I wonder which ones um bear with me probably Angelica I would imagine I love Angelica over grooming here we go yeah, Angelica, carrot seed, cedar wood, chamomile, chickweed, comfrey, jasmine, linden, blossom, valerian. Now, if you think about it, all of those, apart from carrot seeds and cedar wood, uh, you can get as dried herbs. So I sell dried herb gardens and I definitely advocate using herb gardens with cats. So you put them down, you put down dried herbs on a towel or a blanket and you let the cat select. You let the cat rub, roll, lick, ingest, chew and then spit out, whatever like with Sammy, you may just lie on it. But um, remedies are a great way to support that emotional state to help them deal with their frustration or their boredom or their separation anxiety or their stress. Again, remedies can help with pain as well. So if the cat does have a lump or a bump or cancer or nerve pain, you know, get some comfrey there, get some St. John's wort, you know, herbs are such a safe way to use remedies with cats. And if you're not comfortable, you know, looking at powders, macerated oils or hydrosols, start with herbs, start with a herb garden. Come over to the Naturally Cat Shop. We've got we've got 10 different gardens where we have put them into categories for pain, for anxiety. You know, try some with your cat. I mean, with, especially with our indoor cats these days, bringing a herb garden in is a brilliant way to give them extra enrichment. So when you've got that situation when, for example, you know, someone comes to the door, they've got not so Leo will always hide. But afterwards, we saw him with the calendula on the herb garden. I could have cried. <laughs> I was that pleased to see, you know, he doesn't go to it for days on end, but actually it was there when he needed it. So, you know, herbs are a really great, great way to support your cat and to give them a choice so we take away so much of their control of their environment of their resources and it's really key that we give them a bit back so have a think about putting a herb garden down and finally i would say one of the key elements key things to do is to remove scented products in the home so it's really surprising how much things like reeds and um, scented candles and plug-in diffusers and things like that they're all synthetic, they're all chemicals. And having those in the environment, again, can be quite stressful for cats. So if they can't get fresh air, they can't go outside. They're gonna to turn to, you know, what are their few coping mechanisms, which are behavioral, which is scratching, 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 scenting, or grooming, licking themselves and getting to that state where they're raw. Okay, so we've talked about trying to identify what the problem is, figuring out if it's a physical issue or if it's a behavioral issue. Then we've talked about how to treat it. So, you know, checking out for skin scrapes or putting them on medication if it's appropriate. Then we've talked about, you know, complementary and alternative treatments. So what I haven't covered here is, you know, acupuncture, homeopathy. They're not my specialist field. I'll tell you a secret. We've actually got somebody coming to do a talk on uh, acupuncture with cats in a couple of weeks. Um, so, uh, you know, there are other complementary and alternative modalities you can use to support your cat. You know, think about meridians, chakras. Um, we've only kind of covered really at quite high level options that you can try. So, you know, a herb garden and some remedies. But one of the things when you've got an over grooming cat, if you think you figure out, figured out what their trigger is, you know, you've got all their data and you've seen the pattern and you understand what's going on, it's when Bob comes and puts the letters through the post box, for example. You know, the next step is then trying to help them to heal. So this is what you mentioned at the beginning about it being a real fine line between the problem ongoing and actually when they're healing and that being whether you can't break the behaviour. So there are some remedies that are really good to do with breaking habits. Um, for example, like tobacco is a really good one for as much as it's addictive for humans, it actually has the opposite effect in animals. So it helps to break behavior patterns. But remember, we talked about the scent. So if you cat, if you lick a if you lick a cat, <laughs> I don't have, I don't advocate you lick a cat. <laughs> 
that should be on the blooper reel um I'm off the train of thought now Oh, so if you stroke a cat, they're going to want to lick themselves. So what I would say is try really hard not to touch their area. So if you look on the right for Luna, you can see she's like a little bit fuzzy. The fur started to grow back. So the last thing you need to be doing is stroking it. Because if you stroke it, even on the tips of your fingers, you're going to leave your scent there. She's going to want to lick it to ingest your scent to make a, to, to strengthen your bond. So don't touch the areas where they're over grooming. If they're in remission, shall we call it, and they're healing, think about trying to break that behavior. Now, when I say distract them, I really mean without causing them additional stress. So if they're in that zone, they're grooming and they're grooming, they're licking and licking and licking. Don't go up to them and pick them up and try and play with them because they might associate you know, you coming towards them with a, like a negative association. So get a toy is the safest way to do it. Get a wand, get a, a ping pong ball or whatever it is your cat's toy of choice is get it and start playing and don't just do the whole you know wave the wand talk to them you know you can hear my cat voice now but with leo i'm like come on buddy oh you can get it good boy get it buddy come on then you know talk with them engage with them interact with them because the connection with you at times can be more powerful and more emotionally soothing for them than the action of licking and doing this over grooming behavior so distract them where you can. Now, I, again, I don't advocate loud noises. I don't advocate like water bottles and things like that. It's all got to be positive reinforcement. You know, they've got to, to want to, to stop licking for something better. I don't suggest you use treats because cats can get overweight very, very quickly. And also what you don't want to do is reward them for, for licking and grooming. So again, a bit of a fine line. But does your cat like brushing? Does your cat like grooming? As in like, you know, the, the not, not, not grooming because obviously they're over grooming, but I mean, do they like brushing? Will they let you groom them? Remember we said right at the beginning, cats will do it to litter mates and to their mum. So if, if they let you do it to them, again, it's another way to stop them doing it to themselves. It, brushing is such a fabulous way to strengthen the bond between guardian and cat. It's fabulous. And then, and then I've mentioned here about, you know, um, reading, meditating, exercise, hobbies, cross-stitch. I put this in here with regards to our energy. So if you know that you affect your cat and you know that when you're wound up, they get wound up. And when you come home from the office, if you've got to go in uh, and you come home and then they spend 10, 20 minutes with you and then they go and have a massive clean, have a think about what can you do before you come into their energy? So we've talked and uh, we did a talk Tuesday the other week. We did a one, two, three. You know, it's like cat calm, cat calm connection, I might call it. You know, number one, you take a deep breath. Number two, you put your hand on your heart, connecting with yourself. And number three, you bring your awareness to the present moment. <clears throat> and even just that once or twice a day will make a difference to your energy that you bring to your cat. So talk to them, connect with them. You know, we get to a point sometimes where cats are very much a passive, almost like a functional thing in the home. We feed them, do the litter tray, yep, done the cat, yep, great. But when we, when we come home from work or we finish work for the day, you know, we have dinner and then we want to sit in front of the telly or, I don't know, play a game or whatever it may be. Like I said at the beginning, we need to take time out to be with them, to remove the frustration that they're experiencing for whatever it is that's causing this over grooming. We've got to support them with this. We've got to engage them. We've got to engage with them. So you mentioned chickweed macerated oil. Like I said, great for cats when when their skin is uh, when their fur is regrowing. Um, if you've got a cat that, that that is like Luna here, I would always advocate you've got chickweed macerated oil down in a little saucer like all the time. We've got spirulina and um, organic sunflower oil down because Leo's on steroids. So even though he's an outdoor cat, he's always got spirulina down to help process those chemicals in his body. That change like once a week. Same with chickweed. Have the macerated door down on a saucer, somewhere tucked away, not near their food, not near their litter tray, um, and let them self-medicate. And also, if you've got access to the dried herb, have that down as well, because some cats prefer the dried herb, some cats prefer the, mace, prefer the macerated oil. Herb garden we've mentioned. To be honest with you, I, would, I always have a herb garden down for Leo and advise all my clients to have them, all my followers, everyone I speak to. You know, one of my mission 
missions as part of my dream to change the world's perspective of cats is to make a herb garden an essential resource just like a litter tray just like a food station just like a scratching post because if you've got a herb garden down even if you rotate the herbs you know they will use it at some point and they will be grateful for it trust me and then finally so private area if appropriate for a cat so you know have a think does your cat is your cat flighty you know do you know what their sort of personality type is like um, have you got capacity to create a safe space for them so when I said a private area I'm not talking like you know give them a time out don't shut them oh, I had somebody that shut their cat in the bathroom um, don't shut them out from somewhere because that might stress them more but have they got an area where they can go that they can be quiet and get away they can retreat they can feel safe they can be in a small dark space if they need to have a think what your cat needs and how you can support it with regards to making changes to your environment do you need to put shelves higher up to give it to expand to expand its territory? Um, do you need to, you know, block off, I don't know, part of a window so it doesn't see the neighbor's cat walking across? What is it you need to do to help your cat? Because one thing I would share with you, it's not always about what we want. If they're litter trays next to their food station or their litter trays in the corner of the, of the kitchen, because that's the corner that's convenient and you find the cats weeing around the home, it's possibly because that litter tray is not in an optimal space for that cat. So when it comes to over grooming, it's the same sort of thing. Look at your resources, make sure you've got enough cat beds, you've got a, a, um, a, a food station that you, a place where you feed them every day with the routine. Have a look at your routine. Um, look, make sure you've got a scratching post or cat trees, whatever it may be, just check your resources and have a think about if there's anything you need to add to support this cat that's over grooming. So we talked about your energy, but the last point I wanted to say, which I've spelt wrong, oh, I knew there'd be a typo. So I checked these slides twice before I came online is scent work and <laughs> not as in like send the post, but scent work. Um, so with cats, if the cause of over grooming is, is anxiety or stress or worry, like I said at the beginning, start putting your clothes, your used clothes around the home. Now, I'm not giving you permission. <laughs> to start leaving stuff everywhere and tell the you know your partner that you know julianne said that you can leave stuff everywhere but actually like i said every home is a community scent and sometimes we need to do work to support our cats with this scent work so get a flannel rub it on the side of their face rub it on doorways put their you know top up their scent around the home you, it's not going to do any harm it's, it's not going to hurt you may feel a bit of you may you know you may feel a bit silly doing it but it will it will support the cat it will reaffirm their territory it will help to um, establish their key scent markers around the home which is going to reduce any form of stress so any territory issues just do your scent work so even if you don't know what's causing your cat to over groom try a bit of scent work and see what happens see if it makes a difference for them <laughs> So that's everything. We've got five minutes. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, let me come out of this. Hang on a sec. So before I come out of it, here are the, um, the slides for the uh, additional webinars that you can find on the YouTube channel. Um, and this is how you can contact Naturally Cats, their website, email, Facebook and Instagram. We've also got Naturally Cats discussion group on Facebook. So if you're not in it already, come along, answer the questions and join us. And now I will stop sharing. OK, so. If you've got any questions, so I'm Inda, anything that you want me to clarify, uh, I appreciate I do speak quite quickly and especially when I get into flow as well. So if there's anything that you didn't quite get or don't quite understand, drop a comment and let me know. I'm happy to talk it through. Katie is saying with you, I hope it all covers. Yeah, I, I know everybody's got a place on the universe and, you know, when people invent things, it's for the greater good for some reason. But I, I don't I have yet to figure out the purpose of cat claw covers. Um, I, I just find them, you know, quite worrying that people are using them. And uh, like I said, I don't, it concerns me that actually it can inhibit the behavior which they need to do to make themselves feel better. Cat food, cat foot covers on Wish? No. What's that? Come off mute and tell me. They're hard to describe. They're like these little, 
almost like tubes and it makes it look like they can't put their foot flat they can only kind of walk on their tippy toes that they're, they're almost like you know those ballet shoes the point shoes yes. that humans get yeah you can get things like that for cats now and I see it come up in my Facebook thing sometimes and I'm just like oh no I've never seen anyone actually use them I've just seen the, them come up as something that wish sells um do you know wish the like a Chinese based um Chinese based company where you can get stuff for cheap, basically. Right. Um, the other one's AliExpress and you can get like stuff in bulk and things like that. Okay. So, yeah. So it's almost like a little plastic tube that makes the cat kind of. Jeez. No, I'll try and find a picture and screenshot one for you at some point, but they're horrific. That would be helpful. Anything, you know, you know me, I'm, I'm always happy to learn about things that I will recommend and I will try because I only recommend what I try or things that I would just, you know, completely be against. So, yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Um, Aminda, I've tried, I have tried almost everything you said. Oh, bless you. It's really hard to advise, you know, without knowing the specifics of your situation, Arminda. Um I'm guessing if you if you came to me through Nyana, I'm guessing you've tried remedies um, with your cat, have you? Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you what in your in your gut? What do you think the trigger is? What do you think the reason is? Everything. Wow. So like really anxious cat. I think stress. Right. Have you, is she, has the cat had the all clear from the vet? Frustration. Oh, what about? Oh. Does not get what he wants. Okay. Is he quite an aggressive cat? Only when you're playing. Okay. It's interesting you say when he doesn't when he doesn't get what he wants. So do you what is it that happens that makes you think that he doesn't get what he wants? And then I'm assuming then he goes to overgroom. He does not know how. Okay. <laughs> All right. Lovely. Look, if you want to message me, um, you know, via the page or, or drop me an email and tell me what you've done, I'm, I'm happy to try and help you. Um, it's quite encouraging the way that you've tried a lot of things that we've talked about here, but I'm sure there'll be something extra, you know, there'll be something else you can try. He begins to sigh. So yeah, sighing, I would say is frustration. Um, Leo does that actually. Um, so he will, come on the edge of the sofa and uh you know if I'm either watching telly replying on social media or looking at emails or whatever you know he'll boot me a couple of times and then we'll um if I don't engage with him or look at him he will huff and walk off and then I watch him and I've got to be careful he's not going to then start and go and you know clean and lick his tummy um so it does sound like there's a frustration element if he's sighing and that you're picking up on the frustration so um, if you can text me a picture of him, I can try to kind of connect with him a little and see if I can pick up anything. Um, but from, he also wants food always. Okay. So, so see with a desire for food, it's like, two, you know, one or two things, there's either a medical issue, you know, diabetes, thyroid, that it means that they're always hungry or it's to do with the behavioral cues when they were younger. So at some point they've had to fight for resources, and there's been a struggle to get food, so they will eat, you know, uh, as quickly as they can, and and you know have a to sort of a desire uh, a, a need for it. Um, you think behaviour, yeah. Okay. Um, have you if if it's to do with the food thing, I would say if you tried a puzzle feeder um, or a licky mat. So if you feed wet food, um, try using a licky mat. If you Google it, you'll find them. 
um they can be really good for slowing down a cat who's eating too quickly um you've tried okay or hay fever yeah so hay fever he gets a food ball is that with dry food snacks and you get fresh meat okay okay i mean i like i said i would i would advocate you look at the watch the food webinar um because even even treats that we feed them if they've got grains and cereals in can affect their skin um you know things like dreamies and whiskers treats and stuff like that they've all got even if it's not you know um uh, cereals there'll be things like rice protein pea protein and even, and all those kind of you know carbohydrates can still affect them even in small small doses so I would have a think you know have a think about the snacks you're feeding him um, and if he's still doing the over grooming you know if you had him checked by a vet if it was a while ago I would advocate you get him checked again just to make sure that you know nothing's evolved because if you get checked at the beginning of the over grooming it's always worth doing it again you know for example like a couple of months later so this cat that we that I worked with that had cancer of her nipple you know she had the vet check initially nothing was found we worked together we did remedies etc cetera, etc cetera. I gave some insights when we were working together she went back to the vets I think it was four or five months later and that's when they realized that she had cancer and she had this lump under her nipple so it had taken a while to grow but she'd started to over groom before it was noticeable to the humans you know so she knew before before we did okay okay so uh, um uh amanda just put she, that she's got a food uh, she knows about food got diploma alternative treatment for animals and go to the vet indeed he also licks one nipple very much okay yeah i definitely say amanda go back to your vet and get it checked get him checked just so you almost again got a check-in point and then you can tell them what, what you've done and maybe collaborate and see where your options are. When it comes to something like this, it's important to have, you know, different practitioners working together. So if you're great with your information and up to speed about what the cat has and what it needs, share that with your vet. If you haven't investigated or looked into something like uh, acupuncture or homeopathy, if you've used remedies, it might be time to explore a different complementary or, or um, alternative treatment. But again, work with your vet to see if you can make sure that, you know, your cat gets the all clear. Yeah, that's way around. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely think you need a bit more investigation. I'm in there for sure. It's getting worse. Yeah. I would say go back to your vet, um, get the cat rechecked again, give them this information. If you get the opportunity to do what we talked about with the notebook, again, it's a very well to make generalized um, observations. But if you can go with evidence based facts and information to your vet, tell them how long he's doing it for and how often it will really help to give your vet that information. Um, but, yeah, I would get him get him checked. And if he'll let you, the cat, not the vet, have a feel around his nipple and see if you can feel any lumps or bumps or anything, if there's any discharge or anything like that. Um, and feel free to drop me a message and let me know uh, how you get on, lovely. Be thinking of you. So thank you both of you that joined me this evening. It was lovely to have you here. And for those of you that are watching it on replay, if you've got any questions or comments, obviously you've missed the kind of um, chat that we've had here at the end, but feel free to message me or drop me an email and I'll see if I can help. I'll get the recording to you all um, by tomorrow and you'll get a copy of the slides with the spelling mistakes sorted out. So thank you both very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for watching everyone and I will catch you next time. Bye for now.